Don't kill. That's the next commandment, number six. And it is as straightforward and simple as it sounds. There is no squirming. There are no translation issues. There's no dicing it to say, you know, it really means don't murder. And murder is about intentionality. And so you can, mur you can kill as long as you're not murdering. Mean, nope, the, you, you can't play any of those games with this. It is as blunt and as direct as it sounds. John Calvin calls this baby talk, this commandment, because it is meant to be just that simple. Everyone can understand it. Don't kill. Right? We have moved from the meat of the, we have moved now into the meat of the commandments around loving your neighbor. Uh, Sabbath, which was about having this time for community and then loving, honoring your first neighbors, your parents. And now we have this very important directive. If you're going to be good neighbors, start by don't killing them. That's a nice place to start, right? Don't kill your neighbors. <coughs> and uh, it says don't kill your neighbors, and it's not because life is sacred. That's not the argument here. You don't, it, the argument is not don't kill because life is somehow unique or sacred. You don't kill because a person's life is God's. It's only God's to take. It's God's to give. And God is a jealous God, so don't play with his toys, right? It's kind of that sense of it is God, life is God's to give and to take, and we are not to take it. Um, God cares so deeply about life, about the, the caring for life, that uh, there's this odd tension that shows up in Scripture. God says you shall never take a life, but if you do take a life, the only thing that even compares to the value of a life is another life. And so you have this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life type of argument that, that shows up. The lex talionis, it's called the law of the, the talon or the law of the claw. And, and so it, there's this tension that goes back and forth in, in, in Scripture, and it's never cleanly resolved. Life is God's and should never be taken, but if you do take a life, the only thing that's of equal value is another life. But really, you shouldn't even take that because all life is God's. In the Ten Commandments, it's the beginning of the law, the beginning of the guidance, and from there it is further developed. In Deuteronomy it lays out, uh, all life is God, so return stray animals to their owners. Don't uh, take care of mother birds and make sure to build guardrails on the roofs of your buildings so that no one falls off and loses their life. Establish cities of refuge so that if someone uh, takes a life by accident, what we would now call manslaughter, they, some, they have somewhere to go so that their life might not be taken. We do have uh, rules about uh, and guidance about war in the Old Testament. This commonly comes up when talking about uh, killing and, and murder and what the Bible has to say. Well, doesn't the Bible have war? It does. And it is always a concession to human sin. War happens after peace is attempted. And when peace fails, war is the concession to, to the fact that peace is not going to be able to be made. The first order of business is peace, the preservation of, of life. As with the rest of the commandments, the, the, this commandment thus has both a positive and a negative aspect. Don't do this implies that we should do that, right? Don't kill implies that you should do more than don't kill. You should, begin, you should move on to not hate, right? Leviticus 19.16 says not only don't kill, but don't hate your neighbor. In fact, you might even try to love your neighbor which is then what Jesus is quoting in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He's quoting Leviticus. Don't, not, don't just not hate, but love your neighbor. And the fact that Jesus takes this approach to the commandments, taking the commandment as a starting point, don't kill, and in fact, take the next step and don't hate, in fact, take the next step and begin to love, the fact that Jesus uses that approach to the commandments validates that that is the, the best way to read it. And, and this is what uh, we see again and again in Scripture. It, we, we read a chunk of this, this way of understanding uh, how to relate to neighbors. It's in 1 John, our, our second reading. For this message you have heard, that we should love one another, not like Cain, who murdered his brother. Whoever does not love abides in death. And so, first, don't kill. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And now we're on the don't hate. In fact, how does God's love abide in anyone who is the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? And now we've moved on to love your neighbor. And so the, the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment here of the Ten, is the beginning for this way of thinking uh, about how to relate to your neighbor. As I was thinking about this, evident, this simple phrase, don't kill, uh, this seemingly very clear commandment, I, I was pondering how to 
get my mind around this, understand maybe some of its complexities. And, and I found myself uh, remembering a moment a few weeks ago when I heard uh, my dad reading a book to Sophia. And we might be able to get the next picture of that up. We may not. There it is. It really probably looks just like me reading to Sophia since our wardrobes are basically the same. But uh, there, there is my dad reading a, a book to Sophia, and, and it's gone. Uh, he was reading Horton Hears a Who. That, that's the book, this classic book, Horton Hears a Who by Dr. Seuss. And um, a lot, I was sitting there working on something, because I do a really bad job at Sabbathing myself. And um, as my dad was reading the book, a phrase jumped out at me, and you might be familiar with this phrase. A person's a person no matter how small. It'll probably be the next slide. A person's a person no matter how small. If you're familiar with the story of Horton the Who, or Horton Hears a Who, this is, the, this is the line he says again and again throughout the book. Horton is uh, an elephant, as you can see from the cover, and he has really big ears. And because he has big ears, when he, he happens to hear a who, this little itty bitty person who's on a flower, and he hears this who speaking to him from on a flower, and he listens to this person, and it turns out there's this whole community of who's, little itty bitty people on this itty bitty flower. And no one else can hear the who's because, well, he has really big ears and, and, and they don't. And so the evil and nasty kangaroos who doubt that the who's exist give him flack and persecute him and they, they take the flower away and they try to lock Horton up. And, um, and in the end, and Horton keeps on going back to this refrain, a person's a person no matter how small. And uh, in the end, the who's are able to make such a loud noise that even the kangaroo ears can hear them. And so then, as happens only in children's books, I wish it happened more often in, in real life, uh, the kangaroos went, ah, obviously they are people, and they changed their minds, and, and they, they turned into, they agreed with Horton, and now they're going to kind of help uh, protect the who's that are, live on the flower for a person's a person, no matter how small. Hearing this voice again, this, this idea of a person's a person, I started thinking about uh, how that might help us understand this whole thing of t taking lives, of killing. Because when it comes to killing, most of the time, what bothers us so much about death is it's someone we're related to. If you think of most of the time when you encounter death, it, it's my something, right? It's my neighbor, my friend, my family member, my mom, my dad, my wife, my child, my, my something, right? It, it's my something. It's a relational thing, right? It's my... Uh, and, and so when, when a person dies because it was part of my world, there, there's this sense of, of, of because it's related to me, the death hits home because it affects me directly. And yet, what about those who die who are not my. If someone else dies and they're not my friend or my neighbor or my wife or my mother or my father or my children, is that still a tragedy? Yeah, right? Because a person's a person no matter how small, no matter if we're related or connected at all. Which is the closest you'll ever get to me writing poetry right there. But uh, that, ain't that the truth? We, we need Horton to remind us of that. Everyone is someone's mom. Everyone is someone's child. Everyone is someone's family member. Everyone is God's. Every life is God's and every life belongs to God. And for any person to be killed is an offense against God. God who intends every person to live in community and to follow him, whether they choose to do so or not. Right? We almost never encounter death outside the circle of people that we know, and so we don't tend to think about it like that. And maybe it is a bit obvious to say this, that every, every person is someone's child. Every person is made in the image of God. Every person has family. Every person that is killed is a breaking of the sixth commandment. Every person is a person, no matter how small. Yet it is something I think we need to be very clear about because we live in a culture that has more death than any other culture ever. Right? Let's see if we get, if you can get the next chart up, even just for a minute. See that red line? This is by year, 1500, 1600, right about 1820. We started killing people at a, as a nation, or as a, as a culture, Western culture, at a faster rate than we ever had before. 
and, and that's the in millions uh, of people dead. The blue line is the growth in the population. The black line is the growth in GDP, which really are kind of secondary for this. But uh, you can see we started killing people faster than has ever been killed before. And we're, we're really good at it now. So that, that's just, that's war deaths. Um, to look at, to slice the data a bit differently. That worked out well. In the 18th century, the number of unnatural deaths, i.e. deaths called by, caused by another person, was one out, of one out of 179. Every one death out of 179 deaths was caused by an unnatural man-made cause in the 18th century. In the 19th century, it went up to one out of 96, and now in the 20th century is up to one out of 27 deaths caused by something other than natural causes, right? Famine, genocide, war, it's all, it, it, you can put them all together and that's the number. And, and so what we have, we've come to this culture and, and to actually put some names on the practices that cause so many deaths, we live in a culture that accepts such ideas as euthanasia, suicide, abortion, and the death penalty, right? These are all practices that we hear about and they are all practices of death. We are called to live in such a way as followers of Jesus that the elderly never feel like they are anything other than treasured such that anyone would ever even consider euthanasia. We, live, we are called to live as such a, a community that no person would ever feel so alone that suicide would seem like the best option. We are called to live as a community such that every child is welcomed as a gift. We are called to live as a community such that we would never give up on any person, no matter what they have ever done, such that we would never declare them so far from God's grace that they cannot be forgiven and repent. As, and as for those times when we do practice these horrible practices, euthanasia, suicide, abortion, the death penalty, when one of these things happen, we weep, because it is wrong. It is breaking the sixth commandment and is not God's intention. Now, to be clear, I'm not touching the issue of how a secular democracy legislates with regard to these issues. I'm not going to do it. That's a whole, each one of those is a whole sermon unto itself. And I'm not, I mean, and there are complexities among all of them, euthanasia, end of life care, when is it proper to, to withdraw support. That, that's complicated. I'm not going to get into that. But I just want to be clear that we have gotten used to some of these practices and they are practices of death. And we are called to live and be a community that we are God's people and we live and our lives belong to God. We proclaim that we are people that will not kill. We are people that strive to celebrate life, to follow the example of Jesus who forgives and to do as Paul directs, to overcome evil. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are charged to be a community that overcomes evil with good, and to do so in a consistent way. We, to name all four, uh, or, and to name these practices, euthanasia, suicide, abortion, the death penalty, throw war in there, and, and there you can go on on other ways, uh, ways that people die that are unnatural. We are called to stand against all of them and proclaim a better way, and, and to do so in a consistent fashion, right? It, and it's amazing how we get away with not doing that in American culture. I, I don't know, did anyone here watch the Pope address Congress? Right? There was this moment where he was talking about, uh, against abortion, right? And, and we need to, as a culture, we need to stop, America needs to stop having abortion. And there were people who was up on their feet clapping for that, right? Stand against abortion, that is wrong! You know? And the, his very next line. And America needs to get rid of the death penalty, too. And so you have all these people who are upstanding. With, oh, oh, no, abortion is wrong. And then the death penalty. That, oh, oh, it was a great moment. I, I admit I took real joy in that moment, right? Because it, he kind of nailed them. He, he nailed. And, and then you have, like, the people are trying. Oh, it's just, the Pope gets it, right? As he probably should. A person's a person no matter how small. If you're going to be for life, you got to be for life. Because life is God's. And we don't get to choose when to take it. Do not kill. Love your neighbor. That's just what the Bible says. This extends to all life, even when it's hard. You know, and <coughs> a final note from Scripture to help explain how, hard, how seriously the Bible takes this. If you're getting robbed... 
it, it, this is this is how what the Bible will tell you about if you're getting robbed. If it's in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, and you're getting robbed, and you end up killing the thief, you know that's okay. Middle of the night, you don't know what's happening. It's dark. You're confused. Scared for your family. If it's in the day, and there's a thief in your house robbing you, and you kill the thief, you are guilty. Right? That's how seriously the scriptures take life. Even the life of a thief is God's and not yours to take. And if it's in the middle of the day, you can see clearly, you know what's going on. I'm not exactly saying smile and wave at the thief, but it's not your, not your life to take. It's God's. In this commandment is this invitation to become a truly peaceable community. It begins with not killing, and then it points us towards a way of li living such that we not only don't hate our neighbor, but we love them. To be a community of life and peace in the midst of a society that is just far too comfortable with the practices of death. Right? We struggle against all the ways that death is condoned. And we, li we are called to live in such a better way that we can point it this way and say, this is the way of Christ. Isn't this better? Amen. Excuse me. Let us now confess when we have fallen short of God's call to live as peaceable people. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient.